Hi, hello, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Hidran. I'm a committee member of the AI and Robotics chapter at the Singapore Computer Society. Uh, I'm also the content and tech lead here at HOL Experiences. So today, uh, we're very excited and have a privilege of hearing from Song Wen Chong. So Song Wen is a Chinese-Canadian artist and researcher, a former research fellow at MIT Media Lab, and often considered one of the pioneers in human-machine human com collaboration. Uh, she has exhibited and presented globally around the world, Woman of the Year in Monaco, Lumen Prize in Art and Tech, Artists in Residence at Google, were just a few of the long list of recognitions she have obtained. So so much work intersects technology, arts, and science. She challenges the traditional notions of human-machine duality and envisions alternative futures. So as we, as we navigate the rapidly you know, changing landscape of uh, AI-powered tech, uh, Suwon's perspective on the future of uh, human-machine collaboration are more relevant than ever. So I shall stop talking now and uh, pass on to Suwon to delve into her fascinating exploration uh, in, of, of the relationship between humans and machines. Suwon, over to you. Thank you for that kind introduction, Hedron. It's wonderful to be with you all today. Um, I'll get started with my presentation and very much looking forward to our conversation and fireside chat after. So yes, uh, good morning from London. It's such an honor to be uh, sharing this presentation with you and speaking with you today. Um, I can't imagine a more perfect fit than uh, the Singapore Computer Society um, in presenting some of my work and ideas. So my name is Su Gwen. I'm an artist, researcher, and director exploring human and machine collaboration. Um, I think creative robotics and uh, the space of AI uh, at large is a topic that's quite near and dear to my heart um, because it's a field uh, and a space where developers, artists, designers, and researchers can explore the space of hybridity and can play with definitions and outcomes that directly shapes the way technology is, uh, is built and deployed in culture. Um, this was really personal for me for a number of reasons. As technology has shaped so many aspects of my life and practice, I I really try to think about how they're inextricably linked. Um, and in my work with machines, um, I thought of machines and technologies that drive them as perfect neutral tools that could make my work more efficient and productive. Um, but to quote Neil Postman, uh, technology is not good nor bad, nor is it neutral. And to quote Celeste Kidd, there's no such thing as a neutral platform. We've seen industries increasingly automate human work with machines, and it led me to wonder, if machines are starting to do the work traditionally done by humans, what will become of the human hand? How does the drive towards perfection, precision, and automation affect our ability to be creative? So in my work as an artist and researcher and through my work with the studio, we explore AI and robotics to develop new processes for human creativity. For the past decade, I've been creating art alongside machines, data, and emerging technologies. It's been part of a lifelong fascination with the dynamics of individuals and systems and all the messiness that that entails. My interest in working with robotics came from the practice of drawing. Working with robotics and drawing brings me back to the body, back to the mark made by hand, and what things like muscle memory and physical instinct can inform about the creative process and how they can evolve and expand. Uh, doing this work has taught me a few things. It's taught me what embracing imperfection can teach us about ourselves. And more importantly, that the simulation is not reality. That that pristine, uh, that which happens on screen um, that is pristine often departs uh, significantly from how the software is being deployed physically. The program will output one way on screen and another in physical space. It's taught me how art can actually shape the technology that shapes us. And, and one reason why I'm so interested in recurrent neural networks is, is that feedback loop that transpires between human input and generated output. For me, it's closer to what the processes of drawing and painting really are, marks over time and not still images. 
It's taught me how combining AI and robotics with traditional forms of creativity, visual arts in my case, allows me to think a little bit more deeply about what is human versus what is the machine. So I see human and machine art as a testing ground for examining human and machine interaction at large, which has broader implications for relation of technology and society. And through the projects, I work through questions of authorship, agency, and control, and of what it means to collaborate with the things that you build and what relationships are built on the process of co-creation. Um, it led me to the realization that collaboration is the key to creating the space for both human and machine as we both move forward. I think it's a space in which cultural critique, poetics, and practice can define new landscapes in philosophy, technology, engineering, and design. Um, so I'd like to switch it up a little bit today and perform a little bit of my performance lecture, Seeing Double. Two sets of eyes take in the same scene. The same light passes through two apertures that see completely different things. One set of eyes is muscle and nerve, evolved over millions of years, unique in the universe, perhaps, but better understood with each passing day. One set of eyes is metal and plastic, engineered for the tasks at hand, uniformly constructed, yet growing in complexity at a rate we may not be prepared for. One is biological, the other artificial. And they collide. These collisions might seem extraordinary, and, and they are, and it's also a basic condition of our lives today. The truth is we're seeing double. It's the double view of machine vision and the view through security cameras, satellites, and social media. We've constructed a world where all sight is dual sight, and all seeing is a bridge between the contradictions of nature and machine, of art and engineering, and of self and the collective. The poet Adrian Rich said, we're living in a time of unprecedented complexity. Our senses are currently whip-driven by a feverish new pace of technological change. The activities that mark us as human, though, don't begin in, exist in, or end by such calculus. She said that 20 years ago, and it's only become more true over time. It's true. The rate of technological advancement is accelerating. The machine's role in society is evolving. The questions raised by AI systems, robotics, and technology can sometimes point to a bleak future. They make us ask questions about whether machines will replace workers and whether machines will replace artists too. It's hard to look at a headline without feeling one's anxiety to her. Will we be replaced? Will we replace ourselves? Or will the machines somehow save us through technological advancement? Will they liberate us from want, fill our desires, keep us safe and healthy in a way nature never could? Will they offer us a way to transcend our evolution? This duality, the promise of its power, and the anxiety of its consequences, shapes my world, and I would go so far as to say it shapes us all. My work, at its simplest level, is about exploring the contradictions that stem from duality, exploring how those contradictions point at a third path, what I like to think of as a new type of this space I feel at home that, and I think it might be because I'm a product of two of two languages. As a child of a musician, a computer programmer, with a fascination with science and art. I think that's why I've spent the past decade like the oldest forms of art with new forms so advanced we actually need to invent the technology to No secret that I and you and everyone we know is a participant in these contradictions as well. Often we live this duality unconsciously, and in our sleepwalking, we, ri we risk forfeiting our agency. So I explore these themes in my work so I can feel grounded within these contradictory forms by actively building new things. We're already living hybrid lives, so let's make new of our I look to art to resolve them, to, to serve as a bridge between these contradictions, not to resolve them is the new cohesive whole, but to entangle and to illustrate what I've already Paintbrush and pixel, art and engineering, human creativity.
It's about engaging in an active process of reconciliation. Past cynicism or techno-optimism, exploring contradictions in the natural and exploring the medium of art itself. I would believe that art is a process of thinking, and that these processes are rituals. And all rituals, old and new, are vital forms of the world movement. The kind of a way that fear and hope can be held in the mind at the same time. Machines treated with compassion and imbued with perceived agency, but understood as the product of human bias and not peers or not. To bridge these contradictions, we need more syncretic disciplines and comfort with practices that unify multiple traditions. Working with AI and computation is a way to expand what art is and what art can be. Art as cognitive science, exploring alternative forms of consciousness. Art as engineering, constructing robotic systems for empathy and connection. Art as philosophy, imagining new social and moral constructions with human and machine relations. But the intersection of these fields, my team and I create. We create simulations, performances, and artifacts across scales. We work at the large scale, like this relational robotic performance, integrating satellite and biofeedback. And in the small scale, like these prototypes for robotic units inspired by the microscopic threads that link fungi into a biological network. So we looked for that intersection. That This practice began with Doug One. Doug One was about seeing, which is the first step towards knowledge. To know the world, we must first observe the world. It works through computer vision and a robotic arm. We started by taking the ability to be selectively colorblind. We could communicate drawn by converting the movement of a drawn line into digital signals. We were able to suspend this lens by recording the choreography of an improvised dance as it was unfolding. In order to create a duet on canvas, we relayed this positional data back to the coordinates of the robotic unit from the screen-based simulation back to the space of the body. From unlocking the new ways of seeing, enabled by hybridizing two kinds of vision, the robot would vary from eye-line drawings because of the limitations of its form, the material restrictions of the technology on full display. This wasn't an error state. Self-reinforcing technologies kickstart and establish human process, like say a while self-limiting technologies replace human process, like a robot on an assembly line. I aimed to break this dichotomy, to build a technology that doesn't encourage more of the same or reduce the replacement, that doesn't atrophy physical processes in service of computational processes, a technology that creates something new as it's being used. After exploring the duality of sight, of computer vision versus the human eye, we were inspired to explore the next generation of drawing operations. We machined the physical parameters of its limits. To do that, we needed to draw from a larger data set and construct a framework for machine interpretation. Though, so, like human memory, we looked to two decades of my drawing as a kind of data set. It was like embedding a record of my own memory into the artwork. We trained our current neural network on two decades of drawings. It produced an AI system rooted in the analog and given new life in the digital world. So the way that our current neural network works during performances is that I draw a line and it responds with the line it thinks would come after. But that initial stroke is based on the creation of that canvas. It's attempting to be predictive. The Doug 2 system predicts that second line and then I make a third line in the Doug 2 Memory, acting on memory, created a collaborative partner in Doug 2. This revealed the possibility of using machines as collaborators, not as tools. Now I'm not in control, I'm working with it to a common or possibly unexpected outcome, deep flow and improvisation. So I don't approve or disapprove that second line, I just let it happen. And I respond to it to find balance in that duet. There's a potential to be surprised. And it does something I don't expect in a way that's still recognizably my style. It hints at a tentative future because in doing so, it becomes a co-evolutionary, interdisciplinary process. At this point, we could begin thinking of machines not only as tools, but as non-human collaborators. It's taught me how collaboration, 
not automation or mechanical systems as abstractions of human intent, a way to catalyze new forms of thinking and knowing. As an artist, I'm interested in involving my drawing practice to experience new ontological processes. When I perform, when I move my brush and respond to the machine and see the machine respond to me, when I try to guess why it made the stroke or anticipate its next move, I get to experience time as flat and simultaneous and space as bounded by the limited domain of art. By responding to machine gesture, collaborating with it on the even plane of a blank canvas, it upends the usual human and AI relationship. So we're being told that the purpose of art and AI is to automate processes of making. And um, I, I disagree. Instead, I'm adapting my artistic gestural memory through working with algorithmic predictions rather than being replaced by them. Automating my work isn't the target of the AI system. And it could be said that the of art is the approach to co-creation, to manifest this third thing. Uh, it's co-equal and dare I say, gesturally empathetic. It points to the way, uh, it points to the way towards a relational interaction that offers a new form of knowledge production in action. Art practice as research, art as inter interdependence, not codependence. So with my third drawing operations piece, I thought about the gaze of the machine and I began to see a vision as multi-dimensional, as views from somewhere. We collected video from publicly available camera feeds on the internet of people walking on sidewalks, cars and taxis on the road, all kinds of urban movement. We wrote a vision algorithm based on a technique called optical flow to analyze the collective density, direction, velocity, and dwell state of urban movement. The algorithm we extracted, that we created, extracted the states from the public cameras as data. Instead of a collaboration of one-to-one, -one, we, we created a collaboration of many to many. By combining the vision of human and machine with the city, we reimagine what a landscape needs to be. Using flow data from masses of people moving through a complex city opened up a new frontier for exploration. It highlighted the way art and discovery could emerge from entangling systems rather than just an individual and a single group. Perhaps in the future of art, biological systems can collaborate with computational networks and combine biological mechanical systems of equal complexity. For me, this approach opens up a door to examine the constituent and planetary. The idea that complex and interdependent systems shape and interest is the beginning of a provocation for co creative plane to machine network. We're working on exploring phenomena on global scales to bring them into comprehension or at the very least individual perception. Accessing these ways of seeing challenges that at binaries, the binary of the individual and the collective, human and machine, and demonstrates the way we can discover new continuum of sensing, reacting, and as inspired by Stan, we recall in ways that aren't like human memory, they can contribute in ways that broaden human memory. These new ways of relating to machine the way of non-leveraging non-human attributes that aren't just replicating human traits came to fruition in Exquisite Corpus. In it, we explored the possibility of collaboration as biofeedback, as planetary sensing, and as hybrid bodies. It's a performance that's made of a confluence of sensors, each looking at something beyond human perception. In the work, I'm wearing a heart rate monitor controlling the room with an environment made of interpreted satellite data. This P and the planet is made up of flows, and these flows can be traced as electricity. Invisible to us, but through drawing gestures and biosensors, they can take form. This is my brainwave visualized as computer-generated pattern. This is the same brainwaves as a painted stroke. This is the same brainwaves as robotic gesture. By creating a relational hybrid feedback loop of the three, we share an experience of performance with the new immediacy. So we shifted our focus from drawing operations to ecological ones. In our new piece, just in its infancy, um, our piece is called Flora Rearing Agricultural Network, FRAN, um, which activates the lessons of exquisite focus. FRAN explicitly works through system stewardship rather than direct interaction. 
networked robotics acting on non-human ways of, of sensing, with those sensors trained on biological systems, to create a system where creativity and the art is the emergent property of a well-tended hybrid relationship. We're designing this series of units stewarding nature, the backdrop of digital flora linked to my own brain which flops and alpha state, feeding new formations of subtle sepals, petals, and leaves. A network system of custom robotic units designed with the purpose of tending to nature inspired by nature. With Fran, we want to harvest creativity from a garden of AI and computation. In the future, we will link flora rearing agricultural networks more explicitly to biological and ecological systems. Allowing it to fulfill its promise as machine learning through which we can cultivate art, stewarding, and interdependent systems. Right now, I'm designing the system so I can be the steward of the artistic ecosystem. I will care for the code and machine, prune their output like a garden for the machine system. Think robots that react to my biometric and data sets from the world around me and paint on their own are really interesting. It's about extending the natural story even further beyond the visual output of this culture. I'm testing out new energy sources to explore a combination of microbial cell batteries and solar power to so think about alternative sources of power and production. We're curious about the possibility of living things powering semi-autonomous robots that are painting images of living things. The successfully tending complex biological machine system of interplay allow us to cultivate creativity, insight, and new ways of accessing non-human perception. For me, it's a practice of stewardship, the maintenance of relational systems that grow. This is the future of human and machine relationships that offers, for me, transformative, affirmative possibilities. I'm really interested in this as a mechanism of the practice because it speculates, speculates on a continuum of future. It foregrounds the process of stewardship at all levels of ideation, creation, and design. By cultivating emergent creativity from these component systems, we can explore planetary views to computational and robotic I've said that perhaps the future of creativity isn't in what it makes, but how it explores new ways of making it. Not either or, but and. Not binary, but a plurality towards a continuum. In the realm of systems and continuums, the model of artificial intelligence, as popularly understood, breaks down. This isn't about creating a digital peer that operates like an individual human. It's about unlocking the new, unique kinds of intelligences possible within the very real limits of code and the very vast expanse of non sensory human experiences. What would happen if we continue to challenge our idea of what intelligence actually is and what these configurations of technology can be? What could a new model be for relational intelligence? An intelligence less about control and automation and more about flowing and adaptation through a tree of possible actions. What would we be able to see and how might we see differently? In my view, this is where we are today. We're seeing double. It's not about human versus machine, but human and machine. A tool responds to its user, but systems react to feedback along a continuum. Relational intelligence, we're just starting to scratch the surface. We're learning how to be responsive and interconnected, opening worlds to subjective interpretation. These projects illustrate our and their entangled co-creative potential on the space of the canvas. Um, this is our future, and in many ways, it's our present. To me, this is the emerging relation between human and machine. This is the third way, the hybrid where human intelligences and the unique agency of machines collaborate. This is my bridge between the contradictions and I'm excited for the beautiful unknown wonders that will emerge from it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, you, thank so you so much. Thank you. For bringing us the uh, such a fascinating journey, uh, creative journey of your work, right? Um, so I just want to proceed on with the uh, fireside chat, right? So that we can actually delve more into your creative journey, your approaches and your vision for the future. Uh, I hope we have uh, some time to weave in uh, questions from the audience. So uh, to do feel free to actually add in 
your questions uh, under the by clicking on the Q and A button at the bottom of the screen. Okay, right. So uh, I just want to begin. You know, your your work actually uh, involved a lot in embracing all these contradictions, dualities between uh, human and machines. Right, and you are constantly finding new ways to bridge this kind of uh, uh, dualities by exploring different kind of approaches from different different uh, from different disciplines and also artistic practices. Right, uh, how have this creative journey actually evolved? You know, over the years, and what are the different things that constantly keep you motivated? Yeah. Uh that's a great question. I, I love being able to share um, the creative journey. I think in part because I'm I'm very uh I consider myself a very process-based um artist and researcher, I think. Uh I think it really stems from the tradition of research where one discovery leads to another and another. It's not um sort of building towards the end, but it's creating the kind of the workflow and and and, and starting with the question, <laughs> I guess. So mm. um so I think what has really motivated the journey um, has been this iteration. Um, I've, I've been working with this drawing uh, operations unit uh, generational series for almost 10 years now. And I think in the beginning, it, it began with a simple curiosity about um, translating um, my own gesture into uh, obviously a robotic unit. Um, then it became a question about um, how could we make that that gesture a little bit more sophisticated and responsive? And how could we connect that to uh, my own data sets to explore the recurrent neural network and how it's actually built architecturally? Um, and then and then from that, it was like, how can we move beyond a one to one collaborator to something of one to many? So I think it's it's really about exploring um, areas of of tension between how I think technology implicates um the human subject and and art practice and 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 society at large and uh mm. and sort of moving towards that discomfort uh and and obviously uh, being very interdisciplinary like many people in this room um i think it's like finding ways to synthesize what you read um whether it's the um, white paper on um, a new computer vision technique, um, a new sensor that's been made available to a poet, a poem that you read or a performance that you saw, trying to really um, synthesize between all these different areas um, that make up uh, a, maybe a life. <laughs> so uh, yeah, mm. it's been um, it's been surprisingly easy to stay inspired because if I think if you look at it in that way, um, there's always points of tension. I don't think anyone goes to bed at night um, not feeling uncertain about things. So by mining that uncertainty in a way, uh, it's created a lot of very interesting prompts for research and art. Mm, thank you. I mean, your, your work actually has very strong components on both the creative side and also the technological side, right? I, I just want to understand a little bit of how, how do you actually, you know, uh, get the right balance? Right. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if both. I do sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, you know, that. It, it's funny because it's, uh, how do I find the right balance? I think it's really intuitive. I, balance is such an a, a intuitive concept, right? Um, I think your balance would be different from mine. I honestly, I don't think I get it right all the time. Uh, sometimes I wish I had more time to dive into a particular focus. Um, but uh, I think... I think in the balance um, with mm. with translating um, uh, maybe a positional drawing data into uh, a, a machine system, I think to be really specific about it, I think it's about um, using my intuition to register what image is created on canvas and maybe in a performance setting, how the robotic unit moves. If it feels kind of uncanny to me, um, uh, I. I think there's something about, and if it feels like something I can really respond to performatively or mm. or in terms of the work, I feel like I've done something interesting. Um, uh, some uh, when I when I I think maybe for I'm not looking for balance, but maybe um, something that asks a further question, um, and and I'm I'm always looking to that in a way. Mm. Thank you. So you know. In today's uh, AI world, you know, from mm -hmm. chatbots to self-driving cars, yeah, to even 
very quick, uh, quick ways, like people generating photos of people in a coriander eating contest, which I just found, right? Uh, just for fun. Right? Yeah, actually, yeah. you know, you know what? I, I actually did uh, chat GBT on <laughs> I, I actually asked Chat GBT on, you know, how would you actually answer <laughs> this question like? Will machines yeah. take over the world? And the response, well, uh, ha a hypothetical one, is that uh, you will view AI tool, AI as a tool that can augment human capabilities and enhance our capability to address complex challenges rather than a replacement <laughs> of humans. So what do you think of this response? Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> I... You know, I think it, it 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 can be both, right? I mean, to say that, that AI isn't going to replace um, some human labor, uh, a, the, or these AI systems and these tools. I mean, that's sort of the um, that's historically how it's always been. You know, we have uh, machines that um, replace human labor at large. But I do think there's something about which is why my my lecture and we were talking a lot about sight. And this idea of see, seeing double, I think it's that um, these systems, particularly how quickly they're being deployed and um, the uh, meteoric rise of the public imagination in thinking about and engaging with these tools, I think it really shapes how we see images and how we see, and by, by doing that, how we see the labor that goes into an image. I think now... Um, I, I kind of feel bad for all my digital artist friends uh, because mm. now anyone who sees like a really sophisticated digital image immediately thinks of chat GBT and like mid journey and, and a sort of text-based prompting. So um, our, our um, yeah, we've already changed what that labor is in our mind. So is that replication? Is that something that happens in, in, in our imagination that's irrevocably shifted. Um, it's really navigate, it's really uh, defined what's um, what's possible. Again, now I think people are looking for tells. Everyone's like a yeah. investigator, like Sherlock Holmes about what the tell is for Jack, <laughs> chat GBT three and four. I think that's a really mm. funny uh, uh, a shift in, in public uh, and social technical behavior to, to look at um, anything digital with a certain degree of um, skepticism or question about authorship. It's, it's ideas that we've been exploring um, and I've been exploring for a decade. So now everyone um, sort of uh, beginning to talk mm. about it is quite exciting. Sure. So there's some actually some questions from, from the audience. You know, I think in, relate, in relation to this, uh, do you actually view uh, the rise of all these AI tools like Dell E, Mid Journey, et cetera, um, as a threat, you know, as a threat to artists. Right. Mm. Mm. You know, it's that's a that's a good question. I I mm. I really want to give an honest answer to this because I think mm. it's it's such a it's such an emotional topic, right? Because it's it 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 begs the question whether. Um, obviously, these systems of automation are a threat to industries apart from, you know, digital generation. Um, mm. But I think, I think obviously, the low hanging fruit in that answer is um, if the data set is trained on um, specific artists, <laughs> and other artists are using that to generate and sort of reappropriate. Um, um, their their text prompts to generate imagery of a, like in the style of X Y Z. Then I think that is somewhat threatening. Mm -hmm. But the threat involved in that is the human actor. <laughs> um, technology is not good nor bad, nor is it neutral. But I think there's um, there's a way to to use these tools that aren't exploitive of other creative practitioners. Um, like we don't need to give attention to um, uh, you know, image generation that is clearly mm. exclusive of artistic labor. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Just because you can, you know, commit a crime doesn't mean you should, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. And I think there's the same goes for certain applications of image generation. I think, um, uh, I think our idea of what artistic um, input and artistic invention 
um, will shift and change because of it. I'm kind of excited of thinking about these systems as creative catalysts, not as mm. ends in the in and of themselves, but as assistive tools for thinking about um, a certain visual style, a certain synthesis of imagery in a different way, and then making one's decisions from that. Um, I know some artists who are using uh, Mid Journey and Dali and, and those things as a as thought starters for mood boards um, and and thought starters for their own conceptual exploration. And in that way, I think it's quite exciting. Um, and it doesn't have to be uh, mm -hmm. as threatening, as dystopian, as, um, uh, as, as sometimes it's in the press um, uh, advertised as. <laughs> and I, and yeah. I think a lot of times, um, as a little bit of an aside to uh, the threat can come from bad human or corporate <laughs> actors. It's not necessarily mm -hmm. the AI. Uh, it's just people being irresponsible and unkind to each other, um, using the mm -hmm. tools to do that. And people can use any tool for that. Yeah. In my so, uh, so you are in a talk that is organized by the Singapore Committee Society and also the Art House Limited. So in, in today's room, you know, we have a lot of people who are slightly more technical, right? So uh, probably you can uh, uh, share a little bit, um, I'll share a little bit more about your approach in how your approach can actually uh, uh, expand our horizon, you know, uh, in both the yeah. art and tech scene, right? Especially, you know, in this area of combining both art and technology together. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, that's such a, I feel like we could talk about that for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> but to sort of do um, really um, <laughs> broad strokes about um, how I see that relationship and synthesis and how I've approached it myself is I think there's so much about um, working with the robotic form to be more specific that um, mm -hmm. is, is uh, I think all the systems involved, like, uh, you know, designing a, a certain system in Ross, for instance, is it, it tends to be not as responsive or um, collaborative as uh, as it, natively um, by design as um, as what the interaction in my performances demands. So I think in that way, the nimble aspect of human dexterity, um, the uh, improvisational um, uh, time frames and time skills that I'm working with in the space of performance creates really interesting new research challenges um, and engineering challenges for the deployment of something like a robotic unit, which tends to be much more rigid. Even, even uh, mm -hmm. when I was connecting the um, robotic system to my, my own biofeedback, there's a certain, um, there's a certain fluidity of the kinematic system mm -hmm. that uh, was, a, was a major engineering challenge that I don't think really would have come up um, in uh, in a more maybe traditional uh, research arena. Um, and in that, um, that uh, very, I mean, obvious interaction with a human subject in the space of art making uh, mm. and the gestural decisions that happen in that, um, I think can improve the ways in which robotic units are deployed mm. in culture because it makes it um, uh, uh, less about automation of a certain behavior, but more about a more um, independent or um, interpretive agent within um, uh, within within a setting. So I think there's that's a, probably a more um, a more literal <laughs> way in which mm -hmm. um, the synthesis of art and technology can um, inspire new uh, development uh, research developments in technology. I think um, that being said as well for something more socially driven. Uh, I think. Uh, the aim of artistic practice, I think for some, and, and maybe for me as well, is to explore a bit more about the human condition. Um, and when one is de building and deploying and developing, um, you know, different communication tools, I think being able to really examine how those tools um, manifest socially, there's a lot of different artists who explore the role of um, these networked uh, behaviors on mm. um, individual interactions in different contexts. Lauren Lee McCarthy is a really fabulous performer who works um, in, in in exploring how um, these uh, uh, assistive uh, platforms um, work within the context of her own uh, 
um, practice and uh, her, her own uh, birthing story. So um, yeah, I think there's ways in which we can look at both um, in a deeper way, both art and uh, science mm -hmm. and technology uh, by creating, uh, but by walking towards the tension that's created when, when both are deployed together. Mm, thank you. I mean, uh, you know, as we proceed on to explore more of these, you know, uh, human tech uh, kind of uh, uh, experiments, you know, and sometimes, you know, we, uh, we also wonder, you know, what is the role of humans, right, in today's, you know, uh, so-called AI-powered uh, uh, world, right? And yeah. and probably I, probably I should ask you know so what what do you think is the role of humans right in in, in the AI uh, powered world and how would this role change as tech continue to evolve and progress? Yeah, I, you know it's a it's a question that I think is on everyone's mind. It's definitely um, mm. on mine. Uh, sometimes you know my immediate answer for that is you know the role of humans is always whatever we want it to be. I think we kind of forget. Mm when um, we're kind of inundated with all this new technological development, like seems like, especially in the graphics industry um, uh, and, and, you know, tech, uh, uh, large uh, language models as well, seems like there's a new innovation every three days <laughs> and eight new podcasts that uh, come out uh, that sort of discuss all these new, um, new inexorable um, ideas of, of progress. So I think that is one reason why we we really wonder what's left for humans to do, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. when when it seems that uh, when it seems like machine automation can re replicate so many aspects of um, human uh, creative and and cultural um, production, uh, mm -hmm. but I think I think sometimes that's a bit of a red herring. I I do think it's the role of the human is is really what what whatever we want it to be. Uh, I think for, for me, it's thinking about stewardship of, of certain traditions, um, whether that's traditions of drawing and painting and performance, or whether mm -hmm. that's traditions of um, engineering and physical computation, which also seems like it's at risk mm -hmm. of, of becoming uh, automated. So I think we get to decide what we value uh, in society. I think we get told a lot what to value by companies that have a nest vested interest in in that narrative but i do think mm. there's still a, a massive role for um humans uh societies culture uh, uh societies uh, uh deciding what we value whether that's a more sustainable energy whether that's um you know certain types of conversation uh i think we can still really make marks in that just because a, a mid journey can replicate a selfie photo of of yours doesn't mean that uh I, I don't I wouldn't take humans out of the running quite yet <laughs> mm, thank you okay so there's just some questions related to to this yeah, right? uh, uh specifically you know to the creation process okay so as I mean you mentioned yeah. about uh creating work to meet journey right so uh you know what, probably I just want to ask you about your thoughts you know what if you know or probably your opinions on what if you or any artist uh, take if someone actually creates a replica of your work using Meet Journey and then sell it. <laughs> that, yeah. that happened actually. Someone sent me, a, there's like a prompt um, collection mm -hmm. site now, like, and uh, <laughs> and someone sent me a Su Gwen art prompt. And I, I <laughs> honestly, I was so flattered. I was like, wow, someone wants to, uh, try try to automate me. I, I was flattered and then I was sort of like, it took it as a bit of a challenge. Um, and then I immediately was like scrutinizing the, the artwork. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think uh, I, what's a, what's a better way of saying this? Uh, for, for, for what I do and in and, and my work, I, I find it really, really interesting um, that, that desire to, uh, uh, it almost feels like homage because I don't think they're there's they're so clearly saying um, they want to try to recreate something in in mm. the style of my visual style or whatnot. Um, for me, not, maybe not for everyone, but for me, it, it really foregrounds even more um, that 
art is a process of thinking. Um, was it drawing is not the form, it's the way of seeing the form. So the finished output is almost like the the MP3 of of like a song. It's not the singing of the song. I mean, it, we're uh, I think at, at uh, Sifa in, in May 20th, uh, you'll see that there is a whole process of creation and aura and thinking and um, and dialogue that is part of um, not only an artist's work, but all of our work. And, and that, um, it, to automate the final product um, is sort of like having chat GPT-3 automate this conversation. Like it's not the conversation, it's just a, it's a fake transcript of it later. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it really ignores what is at the heart of, um, of the work uh, in, in terms of mid-journey and replicating um, my work, uh, I mean, I, I, I kind of think it's, I think it's interesting. I think it only asks more questions. Um, mm. And I, I find that that's a space that I really um, get excited about uh, personally, but I'm not too precious about my visual output in that way. Um, I, I think of it as a research artifact in a lot of ways. So it just means more research artifacts will be will be made and examined. Perfect. So that's my. Mm. Okay, I, I'm just going to ask one more question from the floor, right? Um, sure. uh, so, uh, I mean, you you shared a, a lot about you know your creation, your, your your creative journey, um, the the way how you use art to create new futures and all, right? So I I just want to have a question that is dedicated to the the art ecosystem itself, right? So sure. uh, you would like to hear about your views on you know, uh, what are the areas of the art ecosystem that is most impacted by the use of tech, right? Yeah. Hmm. Most affected by the use of tech um, mm. in a negative way or a positive way? <laughs> probably, probably both <laughs> actually, right? <laughs> As you have said. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think, oh, what are, I mean, obviously, Obviously, digital images, I think. I think also um, photography, heavily impacted by these tools, obviously. I think, um, you know, uh, co-pilot right now is also um, shifting uh, how we think about uh, writing, yeah, writing our own code and systems. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I'm... I won't um, be naive and say that it's not impacting a wide variety of uh, systems. I do think in terms of the artistic ecosystem though, um, I mean, maybe the NFT space is still pretty young. Um, maybe mm. that dates me a little bit, but uh, I think digital art has always been at the forefront of this type of experimentation. Um, and, and I think that's impacted, but I think it's natively equipped to um, derive new types of meaning from this type of generation. I don't find the industries that are more traditional like painting and mm. sculpture or even performance. I don't think it's it's really, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I think those exist and they are alive and well. Not to say that they're not impacted. Every, every generation is impacted by technological change. But um, at the end of the day, I think there's a real... Um, respect and um, understanding of of the human, the role of human presence, and uh, the role of artistic vision, so that it's not so um, uh, easily um, disrupted in a way. Um, but you know, at the same time, I think there's really interesting developments in um, virtual performances, uh, mocap performances, VR. So that you you could make the argument and say that. Um, there's new ways of of seeing and experiencing performances that are enabled by these these tools um, that uh, that allow for different types of um, expression. Uh, so yeah, there's there's a lot to unpack there. Okay, so talking about performances, I think we are also coming to the end of the of the session. I know you have an upcoming performance here in Singapore next month, right? Uh, as part of the Singapore International Festival of the Arts. Uh, would you like to share a little bit more about that performance? Uh, 
uh, and, and what can we as, actually uh, expect from, from this? Oh, I'm, I'm so excited about um, mm. the performance in, in a few weeks. It's really um, mm. going to be uh, <laughs> something really special. I've been really inspired by um, the narrative uh, history and material history of the silkworm. Um, thinking about other than human intelligences and how that kind of blends into what I've been working on with human and machine uh, co-creation for the past 10 years. So we're really delighted to um, be joined by Leslie Tan, a renowned uh, cellist. Um, so we'll, br we'll be bringing different types of human collaborators in, in addition to machine collaborators into the space. We're having a, a beautiful um, kinetic stage uh, made that I uh, designed uh, alongside um, uh, Z architecture, which will be uh, moving in different stages um, of the performance inspired by the silkworm cocoon, um, multi-layered immersive projection. Uh, and, and I think it's really about mm. examining um, the, the idea of the silkworm and its relationship with us as a kind of, as a kind of people, the theme of the uh, the festival of some people and really thinking about the the ways in which humans and um, the ecosystem have um, evolved and impacted each other um, is one of the narrative threads in in the performance. So yeah, never done anything like it. Um, really excited to bring it to the CIFA audience in Singapore. Thank you so much. I mean, it sounds really exciting. So uh, looking forward to that performance and that's all we have for today's session. And once again, thank you so much. Yeah. A pleasure. Thank you so much.